So civic learning is an important component of higher education, local, regional, and national civics impact citizens' lives. So integrating civic learning in the college classroom can assist student citizens in exploring how these different levels of civics are interconnected and integral to a healthy democracy and why they're meaningful to students' lives. In this workshop, we'll talk about some strategies for integrating civic learning and courses in relevant and meaningful ways. Um, some strategies discussed may include classroom instruction in civics, service learning, experiential learning, models and simulations of democratic processes, guided classroom discussion of topical issues, as well as participation in school governance. I will be your presenter today. My name is Amanda Hirsch. I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. I've been in this position for about five years now. Um, I'll be taking questions throughout and at the end of the presentation. So if you have any specific questions related to what we're covering during the presentation, feel free to post them to the chat thread and I can address them as they come up. All right, so I know a little bit about you all because of your registration, but let's uh, let you get to know each other as well. Um, so tell us in the chat, the chat what your department or division is, what's your role, what do you hope to get out of this workshop, et cetera. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. All right, great. We've got some different departments um, represented today. We've got English and Gender Studies. Um, we have Science Methods, uh, Information Systems, Statistics. And I know we've got Music here as well. Um, <clears throat> all right. Excellent. Okay, so one thing that I like to do in virtual sessions with my own students when I'm teaching too is just to do a check in. Um, I have them share an emoji in the chat so that they can let me know how they're doing in a low stakes way. I know kind of what the temperature of the room is at that point. Um, so I will share mine and you can share yours as well. Um, so need always need a little bit more coffee, I feel, in the mornings. <laughs> and early afternoon. Um, so there's mine. You can, but the, below the say something um, box, there's a little emoticon icon and you can click on that and you can search for emojis there. Great fellow coffee. Excellent. As you're searching for your um, emoji, we'll go over the workshop objectives. Um, so in this workshop, we're going to talk about some practical strategies um, for defining civic engagement, explaining the relevance of civic learning in higher education. We're going to identify some of the benefits of civic learning um, and the particular examples of civic learning that we'll learn about. Um, we're going to connect civic learning outcomes to course goals or talk about how you would do that, um, integrate civic learning into our courses, both in and out of the classroom, and then also address some challenges of civic learning. So the first topic we'll, we'll cover is civic engagement in general, including what civic engagement is, how we can approach civic engagement holistically. So one of the main resources that I've used to develop today's workshop um, is the um, ECS and NCLCE um, document that you've got there, and I'll share that in the chat, but I'll also send it in a follow-up email for those of you who are here with me live today and not watching the recording. Um, 
But one of the quotes that kind of sums it up is civic education coursework should include opportunities for students to engage as citizens now rather than focusing on how they may engage as citizens in the future. Um, so it's not just preparing them to be engaged um, in civic opportunities, um, you know, when they're an adult, when they're, you know, graduated from college, um, it's recognizing that they can be engaged in those um, discussions now and those activities now. So here's a, a nice graphic on civic engagement at a glance. And this is from University of Minnesota. Um, so this is a model of civic engagement from the University of Minnesota Extension. And according to them, at the heart of civic engagement is a process um, that supports genuine discussion, reflection, and collaboration. Discussion includes both dialogue and deliberation. Dialogue is discussion to promote understanding. Dialogue informs deliberation. And deliberation is discussion aimed at reaching a decision. So skills and listening, questioning, and framing are important to civic engagement processes. This model begins with a public issue at the top and then moves to the conveners and community preparing to address that issue. Uh, the process involves launching an inquiry, clarifying the issue, analyzing it, identifying your options, synthesizing data, making resourceful decisions, um, acting together to address the issue, and then finally enacting that change. Um, and then something that's not on here, but kind of makes this a circular process is you know, evaluating that change and whether it's effective or not. And if not, then we kind of start the process over again. Um, so it's iterative. Um, also, according to University of Minnesota Extension's uh, holistic approach to civic engagement, it consists of five stages. So those five stages are to prepare, inquire, analyze, synthesize, and act together. So this, the prepare stage is where we understand the context in which the issue is going to be addressed to assess community readiness. It ends with um, a decision to launch work on the public issue using civic engagement. So that might include public discussion, reflection, collaboration. Um, the second stage is to inquire. That's where we would conduct a dialogue to better understand all of the aspects of the issue and all of the different um, perspectives on that issue. The presenting issue is explored. It's clarified to determine some possible underlying issues there. Um, and then deliberation occurs to frame the issue. The third stage is analyze, and that's where we're fostering dialogue to explore various perspectives and viewpoints and deepen our understanding of the issue. And then we're also deliberating here to generate some options. Then our fourth stage is synthesize. That's where we conduct a dialogue to align the clarified issue with identified options for solutions, um, and then deliberate to re reach a resourceful decision and translate that decision into a plan for action. And that leads into act together, which um, is where we use the created trust that we've built and the relationships that we've built throughout the process to take this collective action to address the issue or to implement it. So let's talk a bit about civic learning and higher education specifically. We'll go over the purpose of higher education, the relevance of civic learning, and the benefits of a civic education. So in an article um, titled The True Purpose of a College Education, Stephen Minns asks some probing questions that get at the heart of the purpose of higher education. Um, and he says, are we doing enough to help students articulate the value of college beyond its employment and income outcomes? So if most graduates think that a college education's essential value lies in career preparation, then he argues we're doing a poor job of explaining our broader objectives, which are to produce culturally literate, well-rounded adults who are knowledgeable about the arts, the humanities, and the social, behavioral, and natural sciences, who can think critically, communicate effectively, argue logically, and solve complex problems. So um, civic education has taken a bit of a back burner in education to more accountability for math, science, and English language arts, particular in K-12. 
So to reinvigorate uh, civic learning, the Carnegie Corporation and the Center for Innovative Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, or CIRCLE, brainstormed some strategies for revitalizing civic education. So out of that think tank came six practices for effective civic learning to help teachers create effective curricula for students. And these six practices are, <clears throat> um, you'll see them repeated. If you look into civic learning resources, they're, they're repeated as kind of these uh, core practices. Um, so unfortunately, uh, K-12 students at least, and actually we'll see a little bit later, college students as well haven't really shown improvement in civic learning according to the National Assessment of Education Progress, or NAP, in civics. In fact, the most recent score from 2022 showed students in eighth grade with flat progress from 1998 um, as compared to 2022, and actually a decline from the last time the assessment was administered in 2018. So 31% of students were below basic achievement. Um, according to the NAEP, the benefits of higher performance in civic education achievement include the following. Um, higher performing students see themselves able to make a difference in their community, and they believe their civic schoolwork helps them understand what is happening in the world. Um, higher performing students are also more confident in their ability to explain why it's important to pay attention to and participate in the political process. Um, the Campaign for Civic Mission of Schools, or CMS, describes the six proven practices for effective civic learning as classroom instruction in civics and government, history, economics, law, and geography, service learning links to classroom learning, <clears throat> experiential learning, learning through participation in models and simulations of democratic processes, guided classroom discussion of current issues and events, and meaningful participation in school governance. And we'll talk about each of these in just a bit. Um, so the benefits of civic learning. According to the Robert R. McCormick Foundation's benefits of school-based civic learning in their civic blueprint, high-quality school-based civic learning fosters civic knowledge and skills and attitudes. Um, so school-based civic learning broadens and deepens civic knowledge, it hones our civic skills, it nurtures civic attitudes in students, and collectively those things prepare students for informed, effective participation in our democracy. Um, another thing that um, high-quality school-based civic learning does is it promotes civic equality. Um, voter turnout is highest among white, affluent, highly educated Americans, and um, universally available civic learning opportunities actually helps to close that empowerment gap. Um, it also helps us build 21st century skills in our students. So students in traditional and interactive civics lessons work well with others. They're economically knowledgeable, they're media literate, and they're also more aware of current events. Um, it also helps improve our school climate through civic engagement activities. Um, students connect with the community. They learn how to engage in respectful dialogue, teamwork, and they also are more appreciative of diversity. And then finally, it lowers our dropout rates. Um, real world civic learning opportunities help to improve students' chances of staying in school. Next, we'll talk about some specific ways to integrate civic learning in and out of the classroom. Um, we'll talk about some civic learning outcomes. We'll explore some specific strategies for incorporating civic learning in courses. Um, and these options include classroom instruction in civics, guided classroom discussion of topical issues, uh, models and simulations of democratic processes, service learning, experiential learning, civic online reasoning, which I think um, is a, a, an opportunity for you know, a broad range of disciplines. Um, and then finally, participation in school governance. So um, these are some civic learning outcomes. Um, the main ones are civic knowledge, civic skills, and civic values. Under civic knowledge, we have knowledge, comprehension, analysis, and synthesis. Under skills, planning and impl implementation, communication, leadership, cultural competency, and evaluation. And then under values, grounding, responding, and committing. So I'm going to share this document with you. Um, 
and go over some sample outcomes for each domain that are in the document. So let me just switch over to the file that I'm sharing. <clears throat> so this is from Tufts University. Um, all right. So we can see knowledge here, civic knowledge, um, and that is recognition or recalls, recognizes or recalls information, concepts, and theories that are essential to build democratic society. So those are the outcomes. Um, the specific examples that Tufts give a, gives us is um, to have them describe theories and concepts of community, to describe democratic change theories, including um, asset-based approaches, to understand contribution of academic discipline knowledge to democratic societies, um, to know the theories of ethical reasoning, to recognize the role of citizens, government, NGOs, and the private sector in building democratic societies. And then we have, <clears throat> excuse me, under comprehension, um, and I'll share this with you. So I'll kind of skim over the outcomes and just kind of go to the examples more. Um, so for comprehension, we want students to understand the social, economic, cultural, historical, and political context of one's democracy building activities, to understand the impact of citizens, government, NGOs, and the private sector on society, and to understand the impact of government and the political system on public policy. Um, formulation and decision making. And we'll talk about, you know, how, like some examples of, of these things as well um, in later slides. And then we have analysis and synthesis. So, you know, analysis involves obviously analyzing, comparing, um, using frameworks to analyze things. And then synthesis is building co um, conditions to develop ideas through group synergy, creating effective strategies to address entrenched problems in society, et cetera. Um, and then we have civic skills. Um, the civic skills include planning and implementation, communication, leadership. Um, so you can kind of go through these um, and then also cultural competency and evaluation. Um, so the examples are intentionally broad so that you can apply them to different disciplines. So you find um, a way to connect these to your discipline, to the course that you're teaching, the outcomes that um, students need to achieve by the end of your course, and you figure out, you know, your ways that you want to incorporate civic learning into your specific courses. Um, civic values is the last category of outcomes, um, and this is grounding, responding, and committing. Let me get back to our slides. All right, and that particular resource, um, if you go to the sharing, um, section of our Blackboard, um, you can actually download that file. You can also download the PDF version of this presentation too, um, if you want to have that as well. Um, but I'll also send the file as an attachment in my follow-up email so you can look at that a little bit more closely. All right, so classroom instruction in civics. Um, according to the guidebook, for six proven practices for effective civic learning from the ECS and CLCE. Um, one semester, they argue, of US government isn't enough to prepare young people for participation in democracy. They argue that civic education would be more effective if integrated more holistically throughout pre-K um, through grade 12 curricula and not just juniors and seniors in high school. And I would extend that even further to college. Um, by infusing education with civic learning, we can connect concepts to all subject areas, and it may also help combat the polarization of our political climate by allowing students to examine the complexities of our system and how to look objectively at different sides of issues. So um, a good way to integrate civic learning into classrooms is 
similar to best practices for, for many learning concepts. Um, have students participate in more interactive, thought-provoking learning experiences aside from just textbooks, handouts, paper quizzes, et cetera. Um, and then the, the document actually goes on to argue that while lecture still has its place in a teacher's repertoire, lackluster lectures and PowerPoint presentations that drone on can be like anesthesia for students and that they're numbed to the really key ideas. Um, so in other words, you know, we want to engage students um, and not just tell them about these things. We want to get them involved in them. Um, and that's going to be more effective if they're actively involved. Um, they also point out, and this will be kind of a theme that pops up again later too, and they point out that since students are tech savvy, though I would say it's debatable how tech savvy they are, um, and technology is part of their culture, students would benefit from opportunities to expand on their technological abilities beyond, you know, just social media, um, which is generally primarily how students inter interact with, engage with technology. Um, and then finally, just in some, they say, um, quote, young people who know more about government are more likely to vote, discuss politics, contact the government, and take part in other civic activities than their less knowledgeable counterparts. Um, guided classroom discussion of topical issues related to your subject matter and students' lives is another strategy for promoting civic learning, we can incorporate discussions of current local, national, international issues and events in the classroom, particularly those that students may view as important to their own lives or relevant to their own lives, um, but also that connect with our curriculum and with our, our disciplinary, you know, specific discipline um, of particular importance, including according to ECS and, and CLC is including controversial issues in our civic learning curricula. And um, they argue that not doing so puts students at a disadvantage because they don't learn how to engage productively with the issues and events that animate our political system today and will continue to do so in the future. So teaching students how to engage with controversial issues, um, particularly in diverse perspectives, can help them appreciate and understand the value of differing viewpoints. It also helps to de demystify click conflicting beliefs, um, and it shows students how to approach issues with more objectivity. So students learn that thinking differently, um, particularly thinking differently than they do, isn't wrong, and that may be hard to grasp in the polarized political environment of the U.S. Um, currently. Um, so in other words, one goal of civic education is healthy civic discourse, um, and that's important regardless of what discipline you're teaching in. So all disciplines need to be able to contend with um, interacting with people with different viewpoints, different values, um, different perspectives um, in a healthy way. Some ideas of how to engage students in civic discourse are to have them practice researching current issues in their local community or state or country, even the world. Um, that are applicable to your discipline, to the course that you're teaching, um, your subject matter, and then to discover feasible solutions to those issues. Um, and then have them share what they've learned. So, for example, they could, you know, in other words, we don't want them to just do that research and that learning in a vacuum. We want to show them that they can share that, that they can engage in the conversation that's already happening. Um, so, for example, they could do video presentations, they could do debates, panel discussions, uh, dramatizations, podcasts, interactive timelines, public service announcements. Um, I am having students, you know, I've tried to AI, make my assignments AI resistant um, and more interactive and more project based. So for my um, composition classes, for example, I'm having students do record a short podcast episode, um, or they can create a public service announcement if they would prefer to do that. Um, and then they can also do interactive timelines if they'd prefer to do that. So they're, you know, give them multiple different ways um, or options for uh, demonstrating their knowledge. 
Um, so the ECS and NCLCE point out some of the benefits of guided classroom discussion of controversial issues as uh, that it teaches democratic skills, it encourages student interest in current affairs, uh, fosters political mobilization, helps students develop skills needed for effective civic engagement. It teaches students intrinsically significant content, um, and it also has a positive effect on political knowledge and interest. Models and simulations of democratic processes are another way to integrate civic learning in the classroom. Um, to do so, we would provide students with opportunities to participate in activities like mock elections, moot courts, or even just simply problem solving, consideration of dilemmas, interactive case studies, scenarios, online games. Um, there's one platform if you're interested in online games and civics called iCivics. Um, but according to the <clears throat> Illinois Civics Hub, these models and simulations would allow students to learn about issues and practice civic skills in different disciplines by only if we can do certain things when we're implementing these. So we need to reserve sufficient time for each simulation in order to learn the challenging skills and concepts to build background knowledge to make these um, simulations and models effective. Um, we also need to discuss how the lessons that are learned in the simulation might apply in other contexts, for example, in our local community and society at large. Um, we also need to build on student life experiences and knowledge of democratic structures, institutions, um, and expand that knowledge, and also create time for reflection and processing so that we can understand the concepts and the application of the simulations and connect them to you know, the classroom learning experience. Um, some examples of this kind of activity for different, you know, and we could use these in different disciplines includes mock trials, um, you know, you be the judge. Uh, for example, I, you could have a mock trial in a science class, um, a Henrietta Lacks mock trial in a science class, or you could do an Ava Perone mock trial in a word, world language class. Um, you could also do something like you, you design your school, um, have them do budgeting, board meetings, um, labor simulations for your discipline, ethical dilemmas in your discipline, um, activities and courses or clubs or organizations that speak to students' lived experiences and identities, discussions of power and privilege that are intentionally woven into role playing and case studies for your discipline, discussion circles, to help students reflect on simulations where you know all voices are encouraged to be heard and all perspectives are encouraged to be heard um, and simulations tasking students with making connections um, with the activity to their local community or larger societies um, and then another idea from ECS and NCTCE includes students simulating a professional work environment um, so this might look different for each discipline, but it could include things like trading emails, planning meetings, conducting research in the discipline. Um, they also point out that in addition to the obvious benefit of increased civic knowledge, students learn skills with clear applicability to both civic and non-civic contexts. And these skills include things like public speaking, teamwork, close reading, analytical thinking, and the ability to argue both sides of a topic. Um, according to the Teaching for Democracy Alliance, there is no better way to prepare young people for civic life than to support them in building skills for and practicing the behaviors of civic engagement while they're still in school, in a place designed for instruction, observation, feedback, reflection, correction, and growth. Um, and then furthermore, they state that students who receive both traditional and interactive civics score highest on assessments and demonstrate high levels of 21st century skills such as critical thinking, news comprehension, and work ethic. So experiential learning offers students the opportunity to study in an environment where they can apply classroom learning to real life contexts by using their knowledge and skills in meaningful scenarios. Um, it encourages self-efficacy as well. Um, this might look in K-12 settings, for example, like non-athletic extracurricular activities and they can serve these purposes and help students achieve goals. But um, often the students who would benefit the most from being part of these activities are the ones, particularly in K-12 settings, who are unable to take advantage of those experiences. 
Um, so in a college learning environment, we can help students gain the benefits of extracurricular learning through experiential learning activities to help students develop a clear sense of how they can fit into the larger community and how they can contribute. So allowing students to choose experiential learning activities based on their genuine interest helps keep students engaged. Um, and these activities should be clear, clearly tied to our course outcomes and our classroom learning. So experiential learning that provides space for student participation and voice really helps contribute to students' further civic engagement. And some approaches include community service, volunteerism, service learning opportunities, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in just a second, um, community research, community development, community advocacy. So anything that um, kind of immerses students in an experience that solidifies, reinforces their learning. Service learning is um, kind of a sub category of experiential learning. It's another example of how to integrate civic learning into our courses. Um, as described by Kinsey and Stevens, Stevens in Service Learning and Beyond Civic Learning Impact, Implications, and More. Service learning is a credit bearing educational experience wherein students participate in an organized service activity that meets identified community needs. And then they reflect on the service activity in a way where they gain further understanding of the course content, the broader appreciation of the discipline, and an enhanced sense of civic responsibility. So the way this connects and contributes to civic learning is through engagement and its beneficial impact on student grades, persistence, graduation rates, um, and students with service learning experience are more engaged in active and collaborative learning in student faculty interaction and in their diversity experience. Um, in other words, serious conversation with students of different races, ethnicities, different beliefs. Um, ECS and NCTE, NCTCE point out that service learning involves designing and implementing programs to provide students with opportunities to apply what they learn to performing, performing community service linked to the curriculum and classroom learning. As I mentioned, it's an experiential approach. It connects academic knowledge and skills to community needs, which fosters civic engagement. Um, they also recommend connecting academic objectives with community service. Um, and you could do this in either one of two ways. You can either start with the service project and then identify the curricular objectives that align with it, or probably more likely is we're starting with our learning objectives. Um, and, you know, sometimes we, these are departmentally manda mandated learning objectives, um, or, you know, they've already been developed <clears throat> for us, um, but we start with those learning objectives and then we work with our students to identify service projects that would help them meet those objectives. Um, and I think the latter, works a little bit better because the more involved students are in selecting and planning their projects, the more likely they are to be engaged with and committed to the work of the project as well as its learning outcomes. So the benefits that they outline for service learning are that it boosts academic engagement, educational aspirations, acquisition of 21st century um, skills, and community engagement. It also contributes to narrowing achievement gaps with low-income students who serve performing better than students who do not serve. Um, it also leads to higher test scores on reading and science achievement, more likely to graduate from college than those who don't participate in service learning. Um, there's improved school engagement and attachment, improved civic skills and dispositions, fewer disciplinary and behavioral issues, a greater impact on commitment to civic participation than um, neighborhood and family context, um, and then stronger set of job and career related skills and aspirations. So that's something, you know, if career and job is where students see the value of a college education coming from. That actually is something that maybe you can highlight for them to get by in as well. Um, something that I think is really important, but also maybe difficult to contend with is civic online reasoning. 
And Sam Weinberg, who is the founder and faculty director of the Stanford History Education Group, quotes um, University of Connecticut professor Michael Lynch, who calls the internet both the world's best fact checker and the world's best bias confirmer, often at the same time. So Weinberg believes that reliable information is to civic health what clean water and proper sanitation are to public health. Um, he mentions the abundance of uh, information online and states, quote, whether this bounty will make us smarter and better informed or more ignorant and narrow-minded will depend on one thing, our educational response to this challenge. Weinberg points out that our students um, or he calls them so-called digital natives, they're able to swap between social media platforms, but they're not necessarily able to evaluate the information that they encounter online. Um, and then he points to this survey where 82% of middle school students mistake advertisements for news and high school students interpreted an image posted anonymously on a photo sharing site as evidence of ecological effects of the nuclear disaster. And then in the same survey, college students rated a minority group of pediatricians who are actually labeled a hate group by um, the Sub Southern Poverty Law Center as more reliable than the American Academy of Pe Pediatrics, which has 64,000 members. Um, students are also, they point out being taught incorrect ideas about the internet um, that are persisting since kind of the days of dial up. Um, for example, one big one that I go over with my students is, you know, a lot of them are taught to trust .orgs, but not .coms, and this is a holdover from, you know, the dawn of the internet when .orgs were supposed to be for, um, you know, certain websites and .coms were supposed to be for other websites, um, but anybody can buy a .org, so, you know, that's not an indication of information that you can trust. Um, or a shortcut to verifying information. So one tool that we could use to help students develop civic online reasoning skills is the Stanford Civic Online Reasoning um, or CORE, C-O-R, curriculum. Um, this curriculum is based on strategies that they identified when observing fact checkers from the nation's most prestigious news organizations. And they include resources that have actually been tested in classrooms. Um, and they argue that teaching students these skills will help counter some common errors that students make in evaluating online information. And I'll share that website with you, but I'll also send it in a follow-up. So it's corecor.stanford.edu. Um, uh, so as Stanford History Education Group founder, Margaret Jacks, who's also a professor of education and history, States, um, quote, it's our desire that the skills students learn through the core curriculum will not only make them better students, but better informed citizens able to participate in our democracy in an educated and responsible way. In a broader sense, we hope that they will share their skills and inform others about these methods. Lastly, we see these skills as transferable to everyone. It's our hope that everyone in the U.S. and beyond learns how to evaluate information sources using the core principles. The health of our democracy depends on it. So particularly with um, in light of, you know, the proliferation of generative AI, um, you know, AI that can create images, videos, you know, so-called deep fakes, um, and just the amount of information that students interact with online and through social media, um, being able to evaluate that information effectively is very important to their learning but also just their ability to function um, in society effectively. Um, one other way that we can um, promote civic learning is through encouraging student participation in school governance. Um, and this can take on a variety of contexts. They can you know, join school council, student council, um, advisory boards, department committees where applicable and where they're allowed to do so. Um, students do have good ideas about how to improve their schools, even their academic departments. And if we give them that opportunity to make changes that are important to them, they will take action. Um, by participating in school governance, students can learn from the challenges, the responses, the failures of the democratic process in a more controlled environment in a learning environment before they engage more broadly in civic society. 
um, where they may not get as much grace. Uh, so they'll learn from the difficult, the frustrating processes of enacting policies and collaborating in democratic debate and negotiation. And students who are taught how to make their voices heard at you know, the educational institution level are better equipped then to be active and effective in their communities and large and in society. <clears throat> so, um, in the last part of the workshop, we'll go over some of the challenges facing civic education. We'll take a look at um, a specific resource and we'll we'll take a look at also a list of the resources that I used to develop this workshop and uh, again I'll send that out to you in a follow-up email this afternoon um, and then also there's the opportunity for you to ask questions before we close out today's workshop or to request additional resources you know if you have any discipline specific resources that you'd like me to source for you and send out in that follow-up email I can do that as well all right, so some challenges of civic education. So Kathleen Hall Jameson, um, in her essay, The Challenges Facing Civic Education in the 21st Century, um, she lays out five fundamental challenges that are confronting reformers working to improve the quality and accessibility of civic education in schools. And those challenges include ensuring civic education is high quality, um, it has not been a state or a federal priority. Um, and so what this looks like is because it's not a state or a federal priority, um, then it's what that might mean is that it's not tested um, in standardized tests. And so if we're teaching to standardized tests, then we're not going to be um, emphasizing or making a priority of things that are not on the test. Um, another challenge is that social studies textbooks don't facilitate the development of needed civic skills. Um, so we can't rely, in other words, on textbooks to help guide <laughs> us in um, developing students' civic skills. Um, also, upper income students are better served by our schools, just both generally and specifically with regard to civic education than our lower income schools. Um, so that's a, a gap that we need to address. Um, cutbacks and funds that are available to schools make implementing changes in civic education difficult, particularly if we want to do it most effectively, which is um, interdisciplinarily um, or transdisciplinarily. And then finally, the polarized political climate, particularly in the United States, increases the likelihood that curricular changes will be cast as advancing a partisan agenda. And we've seen this with, you know, many curricular changes and, and um, reform efforts. So reform efforts um, for civic education are complicated by the fact that it can be overlooked on the national stage, and education leaders also continue to send mixed messages. Um, many leaders support the idea that quality civic education is crucial to the foundation of our democracy, but authentic support for civic education doesn't always follow. Um, so students in states that support civic education often only get you know, one shot at an American government class in 11th or 12th grade, and that signals that civics is an afterthought. Um, it doesn't allow for students to build knowledge from year to year. It misses the large number of students who drop out before their junior or senior year or maybe in most need of education regarding their rights and responsibility as citizens. Um, so those six practices for effective civic learning that we've gone over really together help students grasp a true understanding of and appreciation for how our democracy works by allowing them to examine and participate in a holistic manner. Um, so they argue that it's not enough just to teach selected pieces about how our government works. Students need to gain that deeper understanding from a, a few methods. So from examining the unique relationship between history, government, law, and democracy, and how they work together and support one another, why we have the system of government that we have, um, what sacrifices, 
um, were made to secure that system, what democracy really means, and the crucial role that every American plays in sustaining it. So again, here are those six <clears throat> proven practices for effective civic learning. Um, and again, those are to provide instruction in government history, law, and democracy. Um, and, you know, within that, it's not just, you know, in government classes or in history classes or law classes or, you know, classes that deal with um, politics, poli-sci classes. You know, you can incorporate instruction um, as it's applicable to your discipline in all of these areas. Um, and then the second practice incorporate discussion of current local, national, international issues and events in the classroom, particularly those that our students view as important to their lives. So what are the current local, national, international issues and events that affect your discipline? Um, third practice is designing and implementing programs that provide students with opportunities to apply what they learn through performing community service that's linked to the formal curriculum and classroom instruction. So what are some ways that we can encourage or require our students to perform community service or get involved in the community in ways that are linked to our class curriculum and our instruction and the outcomes that we want students to achieve by the end of our course. Um, fourth, offer extracurricular activities that provide opportunities for young people to get involved in schools and communities. So again, um, we can point out the uh, activities that are available for them to get involved in, um, you know, that are outside of our class, but we can also tie that to our classroom instruction and curriculum as well and in, in encouraging students to engage in that way. Um, Fifth is encouraging student participation in school governance. Um, and then sixth is encouraging students participation in simulations of democratic processes and procedures. And we went over both of those. Um, here are some resources um, that I'll share with you um, in my follow-up email. But if anyone has any questions, you can post in the chat. You can also, I will enable, um, audio right now so that if you want to you can come on mic and you can also ask questions in that way whichever way you prefer and if you don't have any questions then that's okay too uh, or if you want um, specific resources then you know you can also post that to the chat and i can i can find those resources for you before i send that follow-up email Um, okay, resources that help with the civic engagement of international students. I can definitely find resources for you on that. And I will add them to that follow-up email. No problem. <clears throat> Any other questions or resource requests? All right, well, if you think of any, um, you can always email me. And thank you so much for attending today's presentation and exploring with me how we can integrate civic learning in our courses, provide students with that knowledge, those knowledge, skills, and dispositions to be active, informed citizens.